Hello and welcome to episode 58 of the Aquarius Podcast. I'm your host, Randy Reed, and this episode is sponsored by Awaza Living Water. And uh, we're going to do a little bit of a different ad spot today. So I'm just going to peruse the Awaza website with you, and we're going to check out some of the awesome products that I haven't talked about yet, or that I haven't talked about yet, I should say. Did you know that at store.awaza-usa.com, you can buy heaters? You can buy aqua in-out sets. So if you want a quick water change on your system, you can pick that thing up. Awaza fish nets, aquarium cleaners, uh, spiral brushes, magnet cleaners, which are always super handy if you don't want to stick your hand in that tank. Digital thermometers, which I do run on one of my tanks. The fish guard, which is a pretty cool automatic feeder. You should check that out. Uh, let's see here. What else do we have? Scissors, tweezers, high quality stuff. I have a pair of each of those. Very, very nice. Uh, replacement scraper blades. What else do we have going on here? The bio Master, of course, the canister filter that I've talked about several times, and I've got a couple running in my fish room. Uh, you can get it with the thermo, so it can take an actual heater insert or not, um, or without, so if you don't want to run one. The Cleartronic 7 watts UV sterilizer, which I have used on one of my angel tanks when I had a green water explosion, and that thing does work. Uh, the internal Bio Plus filter, again, with thermo or without thermo, meaning with or without the heater. The Filto Smart, never really talked about that guy. That's kind of a really cool, smaller, compact uh, external canister filter. You should check that out. I've not tested one, but I assume the quality is going to be on par with the rest of the Awaza stuff. And we'll jump over to Aquarium Pumps, which I do have one of these guys, the OptiMax 800. Super sweet, super awesome aquarium pump. Check that out as well. And then all sorts of filter pad replacements. Um, really neat. They've got all sorts of PPIs and a whole bunch of other uh, really cool accessories for your uh, Awaza a filter product and so that'll do it for that portion of housekeeping the next part of housekeeping in the pre-interview section is going to be what did i say it was we're on episode 58 people this is over a year of bringing you high quality interviews with other fish nerds at least i hope it, they've been high quality interviews with uh, other fish nerds i like to think so and so this is going to be a little psa and that's a podcast service announcement and so what i'm going to ask you folks have you liked have you shared? Have you commented? Have you done any of those things to engage and help to promote the Aquarius podcast? Uh, I don't ask you folks for money. I never will. Uh, but what I will ask you to do, though, is just uh, share this with some fish nerds. Share this with your fish club. Share it with anybody that you think is interested in hearing somebody ramble on and talk to other fish nerds. Hopefully, I'm not the one rambling, and it's other people that are rambling about their awesome experiences in our hobby, just like we're going to have in a about 10 seconds in this episode, you're going to hear an amazing interview with Alyssa Bentley. So please feel free to share. Um, you know, sharing is caring. And I hope the, uh, yeah, I hope this unscripted interview was a little bit, or interview, I should say. I hope this unscripted intro to the interview uh, a little bit different. You know, want to work on my ad hoc game, if you will, when it comes to the pre interview section of the show. So I hope you enjoyed it. And enough of me rambling on to the interview. Today's date is Wednesday, May 29th, 2019. My guest today is Alyssa Bentley. Alyssa is a fellow member of the Greater Seattle Aquarium Society. She's very active on online discussions and auction participation, as well as the Hap and Bap contest. Alyssa is also going to be a regular fixture on the Corvus Oskin YouTube channel in the summer. And today, we're going to talk fish nerd things and learn more about her. So Alyssa, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Randy. No, absolutely. And this this conversation in general is very, very much long overdue. So it's been you know over a year since I've been a member of uh, the GSAS, the Greater Seattle Aquarium Society. Pretty darn sure that you've been a member for longer than I have. Um, I'm almost positive I've, I've seen you at all the club meetings and just kind of that introvert uh, self, like I haven't introduced, well, we've said hi to each other, like we've definitely said hi, um, but yeah. we've never really had a chance to, to you know, talk anything to involve the fish nerdy, um, but we did touch base at AGA, and that's where you know I'd asked you if you wanted to come on the podcast, and you know you were gracious enough to say yes. So um, <laughs> yeah, so the the listeners get to come along as you and I finally connect and just talk about fish nerd stuff. Sounds good. I really do like doing that. So <laughs> it's it's kind of fun, right? Like when you've got more than like one fish tank, I think your personality just kind of lends itself to wanting to talk about your fish to other fish nerds, like people that will actually care. Yeah, yeah, that's actually why I joined uh, the GSAS um, in the first place. You know, when you try to talk to people who don't know about fish other than, you know, like guppies exist and goldfish probably shouldn't be in a bowl. Um, 
they don't really want to talk about all your weird little projects and your mystery snails are different from ram's horn snails and that kind of thing <laughs> no no they don't and they just look at you kind of strange and uh you know try to try to move the conversation along to something else but i am here for you as are other members of gsas so when did you actually join the club uh november of 2017 okay yeah so you're you're like probably two two months or did we, maybe we joined around the same time then maybe maybe although i think you might have what's your uh what's your member number uh one two three six. Oh yeah so you're about 60 members i think i'm 12 58 yeah <laughs> yeah your number was lower than mine right you said 12 something 12 three something yeah, okay. yeah, one, two, <laughs> three, six. Yeah, it's, somewhere I, around this there. being one, two, three, four by two people. Nice. <laughs> yeah, and so and so for those that are not club members, or maybe your club does something different, uh, for Greater Seattle Aquarium Society, uh, when we have our auctions, you basically have like a five by seven card that has your member number on it. And so when, mm-hmm. when the, the bidding is happening, you hold up the card and that's how the auctioneer knows um, that you want to bid on that. And then when the item is done, they'll call out your number to the people doing the recording. Um, and so that's how you, you know, uh, it, it, it's almost like a street cred thing, right? Like you, you hold up your sign and it's like, man, that person's got a three digit number. They've been a member for super long. Like I'm pretty sure Dean is a three digit number. Um, mm-hmm. Dean might be a two. No, yeah, Dean's a three-digit number. Um, but there's there's one of our members, uh, Steve Ward. He's a he's number three, right? So just a sing, yep. singular digit like that is uh, you get some major fish club karma points right there. Oh, and just recently, and now I can't think of his name, but uh, a gentleman came back to the club and he is member number one. What? And, That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, he usually sits over kind of by Dean and where I sit in the in the meetings. Um, yeah, and he bought some plecos off me actually. So <laughs> that is awesome. So did I really hope that Christine still had his original card, like you know, <laughs> laminated or just like all old and beat up with his you just know number one out written in, in like she might have or something. That- box that she has all the uh numbers in it's it's plenty large enough for all i don't know 1500 members that she probably has wow yeah that's cool and then any new member um or new member or i should say any guest that shows up to the meetings um they'll just get like some generic like 4000 or 5000 number um and that's just a temporary number i believe for them to be able to bid is i think i think that's a true statement I think so. I'm, I haven't uh, I haven't talked to her about how that works, but I do know that they have to give their um, uh, driver's license or other ID, and she holds on to it, and uh, that's how she that's how we know whose it is, and that they don't walk out with free stuff. Nice, <laughs> nice. Yeah, I didn't know, I didn't know that little behind the scenes uh, security, but it all makes sense. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so November of 2017, you joined GSAS, and, and let's go back a little farther in the time machine then. So what's your, um, how did you get started in tropical fish keeping? Um, well, well, the, f- well, the first kept fish that I kept personally uh, was a red veil tail beta that my, um, my sister bought for me when I moved into my first apartment by myself, no roommates. And she decided that I needed a roommate. And <laughs> <laughs> so a beta makes a perfect roommate. <laughs> yes. He, um, I did not know anything about how to take care of them. Um, I kind of did a cursory uh, Google search to see what it is you're supposed to do with a beta. And, or, well, we called them betas at the time. And um, I ended up putting him in like a cleaned out... Uh, spaghetti sauce jar um, on top of my refrigerator which was one of those little tiny refrigerators because it would be warmer up there mm-hmm. um, and he just lived in there in a plain jar with nothing in it <laughs> and I would come over and say hi to him in the morning and at night and uh, uh, clean out his water every once in a while and at some point I read that you need to put something in the jar with him so that he feels more comfortable and has something to hide behind. I didn't have anything, so I put in a plastic wide-toothed comb. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) (laughs) And he seemed fine. I don't know. He lived for years. (laughs) Was there there a toss-up of, like, 
plastic wide tooth comb or this other object? Or was it uh, always yep, a plastic wide tooth comb? It was like a spoon. <laughs> a spoon. Oh, man. <laughs> But I didn't want to put the spoon in because I thought, what if the metal rusts? And um, I thought that might be bad for him. No, so, so, no, that's good, though. Like, you, you genuinely had a concern for this fish. Like, you wanted to try to provide a better environment for him to the best of your knowledge. You did some research. And then you mm-hmm. made a conscious decision. Like, you thought about it. I should probably go with this plastic object so it doesn't rust and it doesn't impact the health of my fish. Like, that's that's pretty good. Yep. And, uh, and that sort of uh, grew into me reading about him and kind of being like, gosh, you know, he hardly has space to turn around in this jar. Um, maybe, maybe he needs more, a bigger space, right? And I, uh, this went through this weird obsession that I went to going to like Goodwill and Value Village or other thrift stores and getting bigger and bigger vases <laughs> for for this little fish um, and spending so much money when I could have got like a ten dollar ten gallon tank or something for it. The good old the good old dollar gallon sale. It it always kills me when somebody on Craigslist or Goodwill has like an old, old ten or twenty long tank and they want like forty bucks for it. Right. And it's or like, who? It, I'm like, come <laughs> on. Like, what are you doing? And there's a dollar gallon sale. It's just so, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's, it's out of. It's predatory is what it is. Is it predatory? Or like, uninformed. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, I'm thinking the value village goodwill person that's, that's like actually doing the, the cataloging and the, and the inventory, you know, price, you know, price setting. I feel like they just have no concept and are like, this has got to be $40, right? Like, that, well, the thing is, is the thrift stores and stuff. They price by weight, not by actual value of the item. Oh. Unless it's something with a uh, like a brand name or something, in which case then you find it in the special part of the store. Nice. I've been to a lot of thrift stores. So, so the title <laughs> the title of this episode will be Alyssa Bentley on thrift store pricing and bettas and spaghetti jars. Apparently, yes. <laughs> Apparently, that's that's where we're going. Um, on the on the point of the name beta, right? So you started saying beta. And then you started hearing people say beta. Were you resistant to adopting beta? Um, no, it was just hard. Because I was. I was a little <laughs> resistant. Like, I kind of dug my heels in a bit. Like, I'm like, no, I've been calling this thing a, be- a beta fish for, you know, 30 some odd years of my life. And now all of a sudden I'm supposed to to, to say beta. beta? Uh, it, it just, I dug in a little bit and reluctantly, you know, I, I've since converted and actually now like the brain just naturally goes to beta. I don't it, it, like it. It's not even a thought to say beta, but I'll admit like I dug my heels in a little bit. Well, it, it depends on. So I grew up in Minnesota and I, I don't know if you've heard this, this movie called Fargo. Oh, that's uh, a wonderful, that's <laughs> a wonderful movie. It has an extremely exaggerated Minnesotan accent. Is it exaggerated? Um, it is. <laughs> and, <laughs> or at least I grew up in the Twin City area, which, wherein the, the Minnesota accent is not quite as strong. Um, and because of that, well, in part because of that movie, um, I sort of realized that my accent was a joke. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so learning to repronounce things has been uh, like a thing that I'm totally okay with. I'm just like, all right, cool. That's how it's pronounced? Okay, I'll fix that. That's fine. And oh, no. I s- sort of keep doing that. Like, I don't say pop. I say soda. I don't say couch. I say sofa. You know, things like that. It, it, it's... it's uh, it's just sort of a th- like I just tried, to, especially when I moved out to C- to Seattle in 2006. Um, I just wanted to be able to uh, integrate well with the other people that are out here. So I just kind of have a, a a history of editing um, the particular mannerisms and just not wanting to have this distinguished. Um, <laughs> distinguished <laughs> Minnesota accent, I love it. So don't yeah. don't feel too bad, and, and, and everybody listening, uh, I know we're digressing off the uh, fish nerd topic, but don't feel too bad because here in in the Western Washington, maybe it's all of the state. Uh, me being a, a California boy, born and raised there for you know 
30, 29 some odd years of my life. They mm-hmm. say JoJo's here in reference to potato wedges, which oh. is the most ridiculous thing ever that I the, I had to do a double take when my, my first coworkers were talking about, oh, yeah, we went down to the supermarket, went to the deli, and we got some you know fried chicken and some JoJo's. Yeah. I'm like, what? <laughs> What did you just say? You you, you got jo- what the hell is a JoJo? And so, for anybody listening to this in any other part of the country or even a part of the world, if you agree and are like, what the hell are a JoJo's? Like, no, it's just a potato wedge. Like, feel free to drop comments or whatever and share your your JoJo potato wedge experience because Washingtonians are not without their uh, their linguistic uh, quirks. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so we'll, we'll we'll bring it back on home to uh, to fish nerd stuff. So uh, how many years ago was that that uh, your sister um, lovingly that, gave you a, a life to take care of? That was two thousand four. Okay. Um, I don't remember. It was in the summer of two thousand four. I don't remember the exact month. Okay. Um, I, I ended up because I was going to the store and getting all these uh, large jars. <laughs> Um, I ended up being like, well, now I have a lot of these. And of course I filled those with bettas as well. Um, <laughs> because you know, collectoritis starts early. Of course, naturally. Yeah. And then, um, and then I was on the plantedtank.net forum. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but it was all the rage back in the day if you wanted to try to do something different with your aquariums um and they were all suggesting that aquariums need to have plants in them um and so i went to the pet smart or petco or i don't know something um i had no idea what i was doing Um, picked up java fern because that's what everybody suggested that was the easiest thing to to try first and uh, had little pieces of java fern in each of these little jars with uh, with my bettas and I actually still have um, those java ferns today in my tanks (laughs) that is really cool yeah uh, they're like you know They've suffered through moving through all kinds of different tanks. Um, they've definitely uh, uh, gotten distressed and then spouted out lots and lots of babies. And then those babies have grown up and done the same thing later and just all kinds of stuff. So right now I've got what used to be referred to as narrow leaf java fern, but is now referred to as needle leaf java fern. Mm-hmm. Um which shocked me the other day when I found that out. Um, and uh, regular Java fern, and I think broadleaf, and that's what I still have. Nice. So <laughs> let's talk a little bit about the uh, about the dis, you know the the stressing of the Java fern, and then them kind of doing their runners or, or their their propagation. Because um, I've, I've had some conversations about this, and I don't, I don't know if we've ever talked about it on the podcast, but um, mm-hmm. I, I feel like there's two camps on that that. You know, when Java Fern does that, it's just normal reproduction for it. It's just propagating itself, and it's not stress-induced. But it sounds like you are of the opinion that it is stress-induced, or at least in your case. Uh, what I have found is <clears throat> that when you move the Java Fern to a new location, um, it kind of like how uh, crypts do the crypt melt thing, mm-hmm. Um, the Java fern will be like, what is this? And and I'm just going to pretend that the Java fern has a brain and a voice and stuff here. Totally. Um, (laughs) Makes it better. It's like, what what is this? What is going on? What do I need in order to be able to continue to be alive and propagate my genes? And so it just sort of takes stock of the surroundings and then produces babies that will do well in that spot. Um, And so that can happen, as far as I can tell, if you have it in a a small jar with a betta that's kind of getting some weak light from a window um, versus uh, sitting in a a, a used 20-gallon tank with uh, CFL bulbs over it uh, <laughs> uh, to trying to get the roots themselves in some aquarium gravel without 
having the rhizome in the gravel. Interesting. Uh, yeah, to trying to uh, tie it onto pieces of wood with string to just, it, you know, all these things. They abuse the java fern, put it into a different place, and it'll send out things that will actually do well there. Nice, nice. Uh, yeah, good to hear your perspective and uh, experiences on that. Uh, in your first, you know, your first bouts of, of keeping this java fern, um, I'm going to go on a lemons and assume that there's no fertilizer and you're just relying on, you know, the, the light that they're getting from either the room or your CFLs or the weak window. And then, you know, as far as like ammonia and nitrates and nitrites, like the, the nutrients are just coming from decomposing fish food and the fish, the fish is uh, waste. Yep. I, I have actually only once kept Java fern in a, uh, what we would call a high tech quote unquote tank. Um, the rest of the time, it's just been in uh, in tanks that get light somehow, but all their nutrients are coming from uh, the water column in the form of fish waste and stuff like that. Um, I but when I when I, when I did move my some Java fern into a tank that had high light and CO two and uh, uh, liquid fertilizers and all that i ended up it all died and reformed in a new way which was kind of fascinating and then it got covered in a uh, blackbeard algae and died back again and reformed again and i decided to stop fighting that fight and went with okay this is my lower light <laughs> low tech plan <laughs> You're just going to stay in there. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've had uh, my personal experiences with Java Fern have been kind of hit or miss um, in, in two of my tanks right now that are quote unquote high tech. Um, it's now it's now finally thriving after probably like a year and a half. But very early on, um, there were battles with Blackbeard algae, which I would just go in and scorch earth. I'd either hydrogen peroxide directly on it or um, just cut the pieces off altogether that had Blackbeard algae. Um, so I don't know. I feel like I, I feel like mixed results. So right now it's doing pretty well. I have put it in some of my, you know, quote unquote, low tech breeding tanks where it's just bare bottom. And I've just got plants in there just just because just to have a little bit more uh, water scrubbing, even though they are on an auto water chain system. And mm -hmm. though the Java fern in those tanks um, have seemed to succumb to algae much faster. So yeah. I don't know, it's, it, it's kind of hit or miss for me on, on the Java fern. I think, I think going back to the, like the actual breeding, you know, the, the fish tank room, because my focus is breeding. Um, I, I'm just moving over to having pothos um, in every single tank is my, uh, is my water uh, water scrubber in addition to the um, the automatic water changes every day? Yeah, yeah, and that's that's excellent. I mean, the main reason that I was using the Java Fern in the first place was to give the bettas something to like hide in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, stay in. Um, whether or not it was actually soaking up new, uh, nitrates and such was kind of beside the point sure, for me. Like sure. I. These early tanks didn't have filters or heaters or anything. Mm -hmm. I was I was a very bad fish mama, I understand, and I will never do that again, I promise, internet. <laughs> <laughs> but you're but were you you were at least doing your kind of a regular water change though? Oh yeah, yeah. It's just, you know, if you if you ever go on the beta forums and you'd be like, Oh, I've got this five gallon something or other and it's not filtered or whatever people will say oh you need to do 100 percent water changes twice a day and blah 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 oh, and it's like, if i i've been i've now <laughs> been to fish farms and i've seen how fish are better fish are transported yeah uh -huh. no <laughs> um, yeah. you're you're doing just fine yeah the the i yeah i mean i love betas and i do not like talking to people who also love betas <laughs> that's awesome I'm, <laughs> so so let's go back to your um so now you've got java fern in some of these in in a lot i guess i should say of your um eclectic vase collection from the various secondhand stores so good job repurposing material um uh -huh. so then how does it how does it expand from there like how do you start building up like an armada an armada of actual like rectangular you know glass boxes well what happened was was a um I and the guy that I was dating at the time uh, decided to move to Seattle on kind of a whim um, and packed up my cat and whatever would fit in my car and um, a couple of 
bettas that I decided to keep the rest of them I had rehomed um, and drove across the country <laughs> and then the first thing that I did was um, pick up a couple of almost but not quite aquariums they were they were actually plastic uh, reptile terrarium things that I thought looked cool and um, put them in those uh, containers um, I don't know why I didn't just get an actual rectangular aquarium I'm not sure where my head was at but <laughs> these these uh, plastic containers were much much larger they were probably 10 gallons each um <clears throat> and i got um gravel and water wisteria and used those plus of course the java fern because of course i kept those um under cfl bulbs the 100 watt equivalent cfl bulbs the daylight bulbs mm -hmm. um and grew Grew water wisteria like crazy, also algae, and <laughs> and um, yeah, they seem to do pretty well in that. I still didn't have any filter, um, but yeah, I had just had these two tanks, and then at some point I found a used 29-gallon acrylic tank on Craigslist for $30, and uh, That's, went, that seems like a good deal. Yeah, it was pretty good. Um, and at the time, I was still, <laughs> because my priorities were backwards, and we did not, like, I literally just had what would fit in the back of a Saturn <laughs> nice. uh, car. Um, I was still sleeping on the floor. <laughs> Tank, tanks before your own comfort, right? Yes. <laughs> your priorities are straight. I like this. You are you are a fish nerd. <laughs> the, the aquarium sat on the floor, too. <laughs> I don't actually remember how I did water changes with it. It's just that's awesome. But I had a hang on the back filter, um, and yeah, and I, and I started keeping. I I had a, a male betta and two male dwarf goramis, which did not work out. Um, and I will not recommend that anybody try that. It was very distressing. Um, however, I did find that female bettas and male dwarf goramis works well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. Um, you just can't, yeah, you just can't mix the males of, or like a, a male betta with a, a male gourami. Mm hmm It kind of makes me want to try female goramis and male bettas, but eh, another time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um... And then I, I ended up getting a an acrylic 45-gallon with an overflow uh, aquarium. This was probably, this was several months later, actually. And I had, at that point, picked up a bed and that kind of stuff. So I, I had taken care of myself a little bit. Um, and got angelfish with that. And this is probably early 2007 um, and I grew up these angelfish and uh, two of them paired off and I brought the rest of them back to the store and uh, I started breeding angelfish and selling those to the store and um, so that kind of got my interest in breeding fish I had never bred fish before ever that's, in my so, that, that's cool so I, I assume it was accidental then right Oh yeah, one day, let's see, I had a dwarf tiger lotus in the tank and it was catching enough light and enough nutrients that it was happy enough to start spouting off these big, beautiful leaves right in the front of the tank mm -hmm. and these two angelfish just laid right on one of the leaves. And, um, and I got to watch the whole thing from the laying to them hatching to the babies swimming around and uh, feeding them very finely crushed up adult angelfish food. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> so you're telling me that you raised angelfish without baby brine shrimp? Correct. That's impossible. <laughs> I know, it's completely <laughs> impossible, but 
it happened. No, but possible, but I, I, growth rate, right? Growth rate, had you been doing baby brine shrimp, probably would have been a little bit faster, but nonetheless, so you, you were being successful with just some crushed up, um, like adult flake or adult granules? Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was basically essentially goldfish flakes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I do not remember what brand this was a long time ago. Sure, um, sure, no, no worries. But I just would crush it up as fine as I could. Um, and feed it in there. And at some point, I got this idea that I should probably try baby brine shrimp, um, but I couldn't find frozen baby brine anywhere, and so I just got regular um, brine sh- or ba- regular frozen brine shrimp and um, started feeding that into the tank. And the babies did actually eat that because nice. they were big enough at that point. Um, yeah, so they. I mean, they they grew. I did a lot of water changes. <laughs> <laughs> and so was this now was this your research that you had been doing um on water quality led you to do that or was it just something instinct instinctively you're like man i should probably you know there's there's more fish in this tank now i should be changing the water more regularly well i i was on the uh the planet tank dot net and um other people had trod this path before me and they said that if you want to breed angelfish in order for the fry to survive you need to do daily water changes and so that is what I did. 25% every day. <laughs> I would get home from work and I would uh, do a water change and feed the babies. And I just wanted to do the best that I could. And this was no research or anything because it was the first time I'd ever done it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but you had, but you had good results though. Yeah, I did. And then at some point I realized that there were... There was too much biomass in the tank, but they were also not big enough to sell. And so I started doing... Um, what led you to th- what led you to believe that there was too much biomass? It just looked crowded. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're doing 25% of water changes, though, but I guess in hindsight... You would think so. I just, in my head, was like, clearly it's too crowded in here. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I was... Uh, and so I got some plastic like storage bins and just kind of filled them up with water and sort of parsed out the fish into those and was doing water changes by hand with uh like cups of water and it was it was a lot of work (laughs) yeah definitely and so what was your first experience like once they were of size to take them into the fish store was there was did you have like any anxiety or did you already talk to somebody beforehand and they were willing to give you some money or some store credit for your uh the babies I oh I had a lot of anxiety. I um I thought surely they're just going to tell me, you know, go away, strange lady, with your fish. We don't need more fish. Um but uh the fish store on Roosevelt at the time, they agreed to give me store credit for these fish. And I thought that was the coolest thing ever it really it really is yeah no totally (laughs) i can actually pay for my hobby with these fish (laughs) the addiction feeds itself what i know it was crazy (laughs) um and that worked out really really well um and i ended up selling i think three batches of angel fish to the fish store on roosevelt um which is no longer on Roosevelt. It's up in Lake City mm-hmm. now. But um, and uh, and then one day, <laughs> the worst tragedy ever. My heater overheated and boiled my breeding pair oh, no. in the night. <laughs> That's so bad. No. Yeah. Um, and the worst part was that I had named them Mom and Dad. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so I was like, oh, God. Mom and Dad died. <laughs> oh, it was, it was pretty tragic. And I have I will not skimp on a heater. <laughs> now, so you Ever. won't, so from a, from a price point standpoint, you won't skimp on the heater. But um, are you now following the, the kind of, um, not newer advice, but the advice out there where you basically will use multiple, you know, like two smaller heaters so that if one ever did stick on, it's not enough to cook the tank? 
Or are you still <laughs> following the, all right, that's the 55 gallon. Yeah, it's supposed to be about 300 watts. Okay, we'll go ahead and go with the one heater. I, I still do the one heater. Ooh, and it's dangerous. I know, but it's, it's mostly, it's mostly because, um, there's only so many electrical devices that you can plug into one outlet without it causing a short. Um, and you know, I don't really want to cause shorts in my apartment all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, uh, my dad is a, an electrician and so I'm pretty aware of how that works and, you know, like you can't you can't daisy chain. Um, uh, uh, oh gosh, what do they call them? Power strips. You can until it doesn't work. Right. <laughs> I do. The Aquarius podcast does not support the the, the daisy chaining of um, power strips. Just throwing that disclaimer out there. Yeah, my dad says no, and he's a master electrician and you has should, spent his you, entire life. You so. should totally have him come in and run like external conduit on your walls so that if you ever moved, you could just take that off, but you'd still have all of your uh, extra power and outlets. <laughs> have him tap into the grid. I feel like, I feel like my dad would not do that. <laughs> I think you need to take that on. Actually, you need to talk to Corvus Oskin. I know he knows a little bit about electrical. I know he does. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> So then let's uh, let's jump in the time machine then. Let's go forward then. So what does your fish room look like now? Like if you were to swag, how many tanks do you have? And um, what's like what's your focus? Hold on, I'm counting. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I've got nine plus a quarantine. Nice. Um, my focus right now is basically I... Um, I set up all of my tanks around Ancestress Plecos. Um, so I basically have all tropical tanks. They all have plants in them. Um, most of them have shrimp in them. And relatively uh, gentle species of other fish, like endlers, for instance. Um, I'm just verifying if that's entirely true right now. I do have, <laughs> I do have one goldfish tank um, with two goldies in it that is also planted because I am a maniac. Um, <laughs> no, that, that's that's a thing. There's um, Amos, the other member of our of our club. I don't know if you've connected with him or not, but he showed me a picture of his goldfish planted tank, and it's it's very very heavily planted, and he's got goldfish in there, and um, I think it's just one of those um, kind of things that in in certain cases goldfish will tear up certain plants but in many other cases there are combinations of goldfish and plants that will do just fine yeah exactly and so far i mean my two little goldfish they do put their mouth on things and it's like is this edible <laughs> no <laughs> nice. what kind of uh what, what types of goldfish are they um there's i've got one black moor and I've got one, I don't know, ranchu. Oh, ranchus are awesome. I love Maybe. ranchus. I'm not entirely sure. It's It's got the dorsal fin, and it's got the twin tails, and it's definitely a little fat, pudgy thing. But it doesn't have bulgy eyes, and it's mostly white, but it's got an orange hat and, a like, an orange skirt. <laughs> huh, and, it ha and it has the dorsal? Mm -hmm. Interesting, because the, the lion and the ranchu, I don't think they have dorsals. Uh, I'm head? probably wrong with what the name of it is. No, but it, I, mean, <laughs> I mean, but it sounds like a cool derpy fish, though. Yeah, he's pretty cool. Yeah, so yeah, so he, he checks all the boxes then. Um, yeah. So, so then on the note of your ancestress, you know, I don't want to call it an obsession, but what uh, what led you to focus on the ancestress? Honestly, I was at I was at one of the local stores and I saw a Medusa pleco. Um, and they have so many crazy tentacles on their face that I essentially fell in love. But the Medusa Pleco is too big for the majority of the tanks that I keep. So I, uh, I ended up getting a bristle nose instead, like your standard, your standard brown bristle nose. Um, and I don't, I, I don't know what the heck it is. It's just the more you learn about something, the more you get obsessed with it. 
I can, yeah, I can, I can agree with that. And, and it's kind of the same. Like I can admit that maybe it's not the most attractive thing in the world, but it's it's like a it's like a pug, you know. It's like it's easy it's now. I have a pug. So you're 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 treading on dangerous ground there, Alyssa. <laughs> yeah, well, they're just they're so they're adorably ugly. Yeah, yeah, they're so ugly that they're cute. And <laughs> yeah, so I'll say for for my experiences with the bristle nose, like right now, if I were to say in my fish room, what's my favorite tank? It's probably going to be the forty breeder that is just overflowing with um, albino bristle nose plecos. And I've posted a couple pictures and videos of them just demolishing either zucchini or like uh, big hunks of rapache at the bottom. And uh, it, it's. One thing that I like about it is with my fish room being kind of fish breeding focused, uh, Mm -hmm. they're a pretty easy fish to to spawn, at least that particular species of of ancestress. Um, So it's nice to have success and all you really have to do is feed it coupled with automatic water changes. You know, it's kind of it's going to be real hard to mess this up. Just let them do their thing. Um, But, you know, some of the nights where I actually have had time to spend a little bit more, um, you know, of of my evening in the fish room, I'll just sit there because it's on the lowest. Uh, shelf i'll sit there and i'll watch the tank and the male in particular because it's one male two females is what i started with and shout out to joe Ferdenzi who actually got me those guys he sent them over with my gardener eye um what? yeah so they, there's, there's a little bit of lineage there they, those guys came all the way from uh, long island so that's kind of cool um but the male like they just have really goofy um erratic behavior like it's it you know that he's not always in a cave and he's not always just stuck to one spot like he'll do these like goofy little you know maybe it's posturing it's nothing too aggressive like he's not actually attacking anything else but he just does some goofy little things and it's you know it's 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 that coupled with just how easy it's been to have a tank just absolutely filled with fry that i've been able to take into the store um you know and and to and to have those available for customers um, it, it, I don't know. It's just really cool. It's just been really, really fun and, and rewarding, I think. And I was very surprised that, you know, if I were to say what's my favorite tank right now, it'd be that one. Yes. And it's, <clears throat> pardon me. And it's, um, it's nice to be able to produce something, have something in the tank that is both shy and interesting and also relatively gentle. But then surprisingly, like they have their little shimmy battles that they have, (laughs) but it's, um, I just find it more fascinating than stressful, I guess. Like some people might find their fish fighting to be rather stressful, but, um, the way that the bristle noses do it is more like dancing as far as I can tell, um, in in most circumstances Mm -hmm. i've definitely had to break up some fights before but uh yeah it's uh and i don't know it's it's more about learning about it um right now i'm at a point where with the uh the cirrhosis uh ancestresses the uh the standard ones um there's all these uh designer breeds of those the, the albino being a designer breed of that, the long fin, a designer breed, um, the super reds, the green dragons, the um, the calicos, um, and the calico reds are all designer breeds of uh, the same, or at least we assume they're the same species of the bristle nose. Um, I like that you use the term designer. I don't think I've actually heard anybody mention or refer to, you know, kind of a God. I don't. I don't want to say color morph, but a color variant as a as a designer. I like that. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm sure it was uh, some some mutation that was just uh, uh, encouraged to continue to happen. Oh, sure, totally, but- totally. I- I think that's where most designer breeds with other species of creatures um, comes from in the first place. Like with dogs, for instance, I, I keep bringing it back to dogs, um, like curly tails, floppy ears, short legs, you know, that kind of thing. 
It's just a, a weird mutation that happened, and people decided it was cool, and so they continued to let it happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my, my point was more so the actual you're calling it designer. Like, I, I've never, like, it makes sense, and I like it now, so I think I'm going to use designer going forward when I talk about those those morphs and variants. Um, okay. But it's just, yeah, you're like the first person that I think I've actually heard um, use it, and I like it. Yeah, free setting trends. <laughs> <laughs> So for so for the uh, that common bristlenose um, you know species, are there any designer kind of traits that you've picked up on, or is that kind of closed doors? Like we don't talk about that in public on the podcast, Randy. Oh well, I haven't uh, I haven't created any. Um, <laughs> they uh, they but are breed you some, working they, on they, any? Well, so right now what I'm doing is um, I'm I'm basically trying to see what 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 exists what is actually happening within these um breeds of creatures um so the the brown bristle nose the brown coloration from what i can tell and what i've been able to read and what i've uh experienced the brown coloration is the dominant gene um whereas albino is recessive which makes perfect sense so you need to have two copies of the albino alleles in order to make one albino pleco but you can have one copy of the brown and you'll end up with a brown fish regardless of whether the other allele is the albino or the brown um and so it's hard to tell if you have a fish that's homozygous for brown or not, um, unless you breed it with someone else that does or does not have <laughs> uh, uh, the albino allele or not. Um, so and, and just I, to make sure, I because I, I, we talked a little bit about this at AGA, but I have to go back to junior high biology. Um, oh. the, the alleles are the... It's like you have the two, you've got two traits, right? You've got, um, or like two markers, is it? For yeah. For a given trait. And it's either you've got homo being you've got two of the same. Uh-huh. Or hetero meaning you've got uh, two different, different ones. Yes, okay. exactly. Okay. Yeah. So you've got your, your dominant and your um, subdominant traits uh, or recessive, right? Dominant and recessive traits. The dominant one will always express itself. Recessive trait, you need two of them in order to uh, have that trait be expressed. And that's where the, well, God, I, and I even Googled it too, but like the Pundit Square or Gregory the Mendel Square where um, you Pundit. basically, is it is it Pundit Square? Yeah, okay. P-U-N-N-E-T. Yeah, and he, in his experiments, he was, like, he was like a monk and he was doing it with peas and it was wrinkled yes. peas is what was the recessive trait. So if you picture like in in your head the, the four square box, um, mm-hmm. And basically, you match up the alleles. I think you, you, is the term for it, and then that can kind of predict like what probability of offspring you'll get from this parental pairing. Yes, yes, and it's really easy to do that with um, uh, creatures where it's like one gene, just one gene needs to be switched in order for the thing to happen. If it needed a whole variety of different genes. Um, along their uh, genetic, uh, or a whole variety of different, yeah, a whole, whole variety of different genes to be switched in order to make the thing happen, then you would end up with a whole bunch of essentially mud. <laughs> it would be, you wouldn't, you wouldn't really be able to tell what specifically you had, um, what had been mixed. Like you would never want to mix an albino with a brown because you would just end up with a bunch of garbage. <laughs> mm-hmm. But, as we can tell, the albino and the brown seems to be a dominant recessive trait situation. Um, and so and so it seems to be with the long fin and the short fin. And it seems like the long fin is actually the dominant trait. The long fin is the dominant trait? Yes, which that I know is shocking. It's completely shocking. It does not make any sense. But on the other hand, it kind of makes sense in the fact that the long fin uh, fish in the wild would have just gotten picked off. So you would want that trait to just kind of go away in the wild. You would not want that to survive at all 
in any way. You would not want to have recessive traits popping up or anything. Not that nature always makes sense in that way, but that seems to be what it is. Um, but, albin- so- but, but like albinism is a recessive trait, and that would Correct. get that gets picked off in the wild. So how is it that Longfin then could potentially be the dominant trait if it too is getting picked off in the wild? You know, I don't, I don't know. Huh. I'm not mother nature. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Hey, no, no worries. No worries. I've, I've, I've literally gone around this in my head like 50 bazillion times. And, um, there's a woman who knows way more about Plecos than me. Um, is this, is this goes by Barbie? Yeah. Bar- Pleco Barbie. That's awesome. Yeah. Cause she's talked at the club before a couple years ago, I think. Yes. And I have listened to her talk, um, probably 12 times. Ooh, I need to go back and listen to this one. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's really fascinating if you're fascinated by Plecos. Um, and she suggested that it seemed to be a dominant trait. And so I wanted to test that myself. Um, and I have this uh, male albino, uh, bristlenose pleco, who is long fin, who I have now bred with so many female plecos that, it, he, you know, he's kind of the town bicycle at this point. Um, <laughs> the town bicycle, jeez. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. He well he he's like the best dad. Um so the 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 bristle nose hangs out in a cave, the male will hang out in a cave and fan the eggs and um raise them um until they're ready to escape from the cave. And I have bred a couple of other males, uh, but they they seem to be kinda like like they don't really care. <laughs> They don't hang out in the cave nearly as well as he does. Um, and so, because I've bred him with so many different females, and, and by I've bred him, I mean he's been in the tank with other female bristlenoses and babies happen, um, I have learned that every single baby that he produces has long fins. Wow. Yes. Like, without fail. Um one hundred percent. And if I have two plecos that have standard or short fins, every single one of their babies will have short fins. But then on the other hand, I did have a pair of long fin green dragons and about twenty five percent of their offspring had short fins. And 75% had long. Um, And if you do your Punnett squares, that would suggest that the long fin trait in this species is dominant. And it also suggests that um, my male albino is homozygous for the long fin trait, which is pretty handy. (laughs) Yeah, no, definitely. And so then the green dragons would be heterozygous for the long fin trait. Yes, or both the, ma- the okay, male both and the female would both be heterozygous for it. Wow, that is super cool. Mm-hmm. That is awesome stuff, Alyssa. Yeah. Um, and I recently found out, um, this was kind of by accident, I had moved, I had moved, his name is Lemon Cakes, the, uh, the albino. <laughs> of course it is. I mean, yes. <laughs> naturally. Yeah, so he's one of the few that I actually have a name for. Um, he was getting into a fight with the brown male uh, standard fin bristlenose that I had um, in the tank that they were both in. And I thought for sure Lemon Cakes was going to die. So I just was like, okay, whatever happens, happens. I scooped him up, put him into the tank that I had my females just kind of hanging out in because I don't like them breeding all the time. Um, <laughs> and, and, and why would that be? Why, why won't you like them to, to interrupt your story? Well, so they have like 150 babies at a time and they will breed every month. If you let them every month, every month and a half. And which is amazing, which is amazing. And they take like six months to grow up enough to be able to, um, go anywhere. 
So you can be drowning in baby bristle noses, just drowning in them. And because they're so easy to breed, everybody is breeding them. So it's almost impossible to offload these guys. <laughs> so I try to, you know, it, it's birth control. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> But I feel like for, for social media footage, though, there's nothing better than just a tank that's absolutely covered with, uh, with like, multi-generation bristlenose. And that's, that's what's so cool right now, too, in my tank is that it's, it's like five or six generations of bristlenose juvenile all the way down to the smallest fry that are out of the cave. True, but... I have, I mean, there's photogenic options, but then I also have to be responsible, a responsible fish person. And I do have a job. I do have to go away <laughs> during the day, so I can't be doing, you know. The manual water changes five times every, a day to keep that bio load. No, I've got you. Yeah. I mean, I have to wait until I have, like, I own a house before I can set up an auto water change system. Like, no, some... no. Fair, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> so... Yeah. No, no, but, no worries um, at all. So when Lemon Cakes ended up going into this tank with these females, um, obviously those females were like, I'm full of eggs. Please take care of these for me. And um, I did not think this would happen. But when my green dragon female went into the cave with Lemon Cakes, um, out came green dragon babies. Interesting. So, yes. so what does that what does that Punnett square tell us? So that tells me that the green dragon is a, a, a coloration is dominant, and I'm just making a conjecture that it means that the green dragon coloration is probably a mutation of the brown color. Which that makes sense. Um, now. I, not a geneticist. I have not looked at these genes. I'm just drawing a conclusion. So just that's the caveat. Um, it just, it seems like it. Because uh, I can't imagine any other way. I would have expected browns. Because that seems to be the default. But that is not what happened. So, I got no browns from that. I got green dragons. So the, the green here. dragon coloration is a dominant color morph. Yes. Okay. A Muta dominant potential mutation of the brown. Of the brown. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, again, without being a geneticist and playing Jurassic Park, I mean, that directionally kind of feels right that it would be a mutation of the the standard natural color as opposed to like a mutation of the albino. Right. Um. And, and as far as fins go, um, did is lemon cakes is long fin, right? That's what we yep. established. Okay. Um. So then, what happened with the finage? They were 100% long fin. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, the female is heterozygous for long fin, um, and so she has long fins. Um, and then Lemon Cakes, well, he's homozygous for long fin, and we've already established that every single baby that he raises has long fin. Um, so, yeah, so that's what happened. So. <laughs> and then to, to correct me if I'm wrong, but in the Punnett Square, that, should, that combination of Lemon Cakes... And uh, and non and non uh, or green dragon female cakes um, mm -hmm. shouldn't there have been twenty five percent that were wait no no nope. nope, nope. because he's dominant never never mind yeah it's in my head it's that top right box it's the top right box that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's what it is no cool I've definitely sat there and drawn out squares to figure this out <laughs> that is so awesome i hope I hope people that are listening to this like if you're like when you're not driving listening to this podcast that you bust out a little punnett square or google it and right. it'll totally bring you back to junior high biology or freshman biology whenever it was that uh you learned about punnett and uh, him being a monk and and the peas and whatnot that's that's just good times right there yeah it's pretty good um and so my next my next thing is to have a more controlled environment because there was um, there's other females in that in that tank, and I wanted to I want to get a controlled environment where it's just lemon cakes and my female green dragon, and um, just so that I can see what and who comes out of that too because I I really realistically only ended up seeing a few babies from that 
situation. And I think part of that was that I have a larger, more aggressive female in that tank. And they will go in and um, destroy eggs if they can in order to let their eggs go in there. Um, so, yeah, so it's, it's this whole drama. <laughs> um, but that's going to happen later. It's not going to be right now. Um, Lemon Cakes put out like four batches of eggs in the last few months and I need to let him put meat back on his bones and <laughs> cause they don't eat when they're sitting on eggs. Um, and I don't want him to starve to death. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's actually a good piece of insight. So, so given then again, that I have so many generations of bristle nose, I'm going to go and take a look at my mail. Um, cause mm-hmm. I, I know for sure that I've seen him out. Like I see him when I drop hunks of, uh, of rapashi in there, as long as he doesn't have eggs that he's guarding, he he's out mm-hmm. and he's eating. So, um, that is a good note, though, just for me uh, to make sure that, you know, I'm practicing good husbandry. And if, if my stud needs a little bit of a recuperation time, that I can scoop him out and put him in one of the spare tanks and let him, you know, have a little me time to, to rest and relax. Oh, yeah. And it really depends on how how strong the parent uh, drive is for your, your fish. Um, some are like, whatever, I'm hungry. I'm going to come out here and do this. I don't care if you have eggs all over i'm just gonna not do that (laughs) and they'll go and they'll eat and then lemon cakes just seems to have such a high uh parent drive that he does not care he will just sit there in the tube and yeah and i get i get worried for him sometimes so (laughs) i have to intervene sometimes um but then the other interesting thing is the the super reds um and I received a handful of uh, standard tail super reds from Corvus Oskin, because, you know, um, and he, because we were trading stuff. And uh, I want to try to breed long fin super reds from my long fin albino and see if I can through a couple of generations, create the long fin super reds, even though it would be way easier to just buy long fin super reds. (laughs) Well, Um, well, I mean, what you laugh about that, but I mean, what I love is that, you know, it's, it's the, you know, the scientific inquisitive mind that you have that, you know, it's not necessarily about having said creature or said fish. It's, mm -hmm. you know, this experimentation to understand like how these, um, morphs and these, you know, these various fish types come around and everybody listening to this, like should really encourage and, and thank you for this kind of work, because that's how we end up with these, you know, cool and different designer fish that, you know, you come out with like the, the black Ram, right. The black, the dark Knight black Ram that, you know, right. through you know, a multiple, multiple generations, this guy in, uh, in Israel or wherever he was from, um, ended up breeding this, you know, kind of almost all black, uh, fish. And that's, you know, like we have to, we have to applaud and encourage you for wanting to do that kind of stuff. And I think that's just amazing and fascinating. Yeah. And it's, it's a thing that's been done before. Um, obviously, cause we have the long fin super red. Um, but I feel the need to, to try to understand it. Um, like I want to know is the super red coloration, a, another morph of the brown or is there like what what is it is it a dominant trait is it a some other trait um is it a recessive trait um and i was reading online and right now i can't remember whose blog it was but there was one uh, local, not local. Um, there's one fish breeder in the United States that, uh, many years back was, was only able to get the short fin super reds and wanted long fin and was not able to acquire them from anyone. Like they were all over in Europe and not in the United States. And so they ended up breeding, the long fin uh, albino with short fin super reds that they had 
uh, raised and ended up with all browns, but with brighter spots. Like, I guess they were slightly more attractive brown bristle noses. And then we're able to back breed those, that generation, like a long fin from that generation with uh, their super reds again, and able to get a few super reds, long fin super reds from that pairing. Um, So I want to try to walk in that same pattern and see if that also works for me. No, that's awesome. And I think, but uh, to me also, it's what else are you going to uncover along the way? Like, you you know, you say that you're not really going in uncharted territories that people have done this before. Tr- mm-hmm. True. But on your journey though, you know, genetics and throwing mutations, like that's just all, that's just all random chance. And maybe in your fish room, even though it's not a massive breeding facility, maybe you get some color more for some genetic variation that it's like, wow, what is that? And you're able to document it and you're able to, to, you know, maybe line breed it. So it breeds true. And we've got this new, like awesome, amazing, uh, super attractive bristle nose variant. Right. Who knows? I mean, what happens if you breed a green dragon with a super red? That sounds like a, I don't, I don't know. That's a pop question. Yeah. I have no quiz. idea. <laughs> <laughs> the, the main thing is, is they do take, um, like a year to a year and a half to grow up, to be, um, old enough to actually breed. Mm-hmm. And so the, the super reds that I have are probably five months old. So I've got at least another year (laughs) before I can even start down this process. And then it'll be another year and a half before I can breed those babies back to, you know, to one of the adult super reds. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know what gender my super reds are. Maybe they're all male. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And then I'll have to uh, beg Joel to lend me a female. (laughs) Because I know he has those. <laughs> well, I've got uh, I have short fin super reds that are breeding right now, and they actually came from uh, from Corey. So you know that's uh-huh. some, that's some pretty cool lineage to be like, yeah, I've got Corey McElroy's uh, super reds, and they're breeding. So I have those. I've got those short fins. So if mm-hmm. you need those, I got you covered. Um, and then I did get in six or seven uh, super red long fins, and so it's probably going to be about another six months before those guys are. I'm um, going to be breeding size. So they're just growing out right now, but I got your back a list. If you uh, Joel doesn't have you, I've got you. Nice. Thank you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, and, and again, just, like this whole, this whole like long game, this patience, like everything that you're doing, you know, people in this hobby should be thanking you. People should be going and finding you on Facebook and saying, Alyssa, awesome stuff. Good job. Keep up the experimentation. I hope you find something cool. Share your findings with us, you know, put together a fish. Uh, and this is actually legit, like put together your fish presentation and talk at all the clubs and all that good stuff. Like I'd love to, I'd love to see you present at GSAS on this, um, get yourself a year free membership or whatever it is we do for our, our guest speakers. Um, <laughs> But no, I think, I think that would be amazing. And it's, and it's it, to me, it's, it's almost akin to, you know, we should be thanking those people that go out, uh, out into the, the, the wilderness and look for new species and, um, you know, do all this conservation work. Like there's just so many, uh, there's the just the players of the world. <laughs> yeah. You know, people like that. I mean, there's so many like different avenues that people are putting their heart and soul and all of their dedicated time into that, you know, it's, it's, it, it makes it so that this hobby is what it is. And that when you go into your local fish store, you have this selection, right. And you are like, man, what is, what is that thing? Like, Oh, that's the new, that's the new blue barracuda, uh, albino <laughs> bristle nose that uh, Alyssa Bentley in Seattle, Washington produced. Yeah. Shout out to, to GSAS members for being awesome. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Alyssa, I want to thank you so much for, for coming on here and, uh, and just really unpacking and talking about all the, the cool stuff that, that you've done and all the cool stuff that you're doing right now with bristle nose. And we just kind of scratched the surface. So you're definitely gonna have to come on in a couple months and we'll talk about your work on endlers and, um, you know, maybe get some other updates on some, some cool stuff you've got going on. So, um, well, that'd be true. Yeah. If we wait a couple of months, I can see what actual color the babies from my, my new line actually look like <laughs> yeah that, that i mean if that's a teaser right there you know new right. line of of uh of a super awesome fish so uh Alyssa, thank you so much for taking time out and I, I really enjoyed talking with you and getting to know you sounds good thanks for talking to me randy